May I welcome our next speaker, Professor Paolo Giraldilli. Paolo, Gir Paolo Giraldilli, Associate Professor in the Department of History at Bugazishi Posforos University, is an art and architectural historian with experience and background on European Ottoman encounters during the long 19th century. After his PhD thesis on Italian architects in Istanbul, University of Naples, 1996, he published extensively on the visual and spatial dimensions of cohabitation in the plural environment of Istanbul and other Ottoman cities. Professor Girardini paper title is Iconographies of the Levant circa 1800. Please welcome Dr. Girardini. So thank you very much <clears throat> for the introduction. I would like to thank uh, warmly the organizers of this. Uh, it should be, yeah, OK. So uh, maybe. Uh, the organizers of this wonderful <clears throat> meeting, uh, particularly Professor Olga Nefedova, um, and also uh, a special thank to uh, a colleague, uh, art historian, uh, Brian Liulin, with whom I had um, important exchanges recently, and uh, they are in part reflected in, the, in this uh, presentation. So iconographies of the Levant um, around 1800 <coughs> means, for me, um, an approach to the visual uh, representation of places that were naturally exposed to encounters and interaction between several actors, several not, not only East and West, but uh, maybe a more complex, nuanced, uh, uh, plural environment. Uh, I will... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I don't know which, ah, okay. So the Levant as a site of encounter, not simply between East and West, rather a space of cohabitation, however peaceful or conflictive depends on uh, the historical contexts. Metissage, hybridity, overlaps resulting from historical interactions among plural and diverse social cultural groups. Uh, this lecture was focused especially on uh, those parts of Istanbul that were inhabited by large groups of Europeans, Levantines, and non-Muslim Ottomans, without excluding contacts with the Ottoman Muslims. Pera and Galata on the northern shore of the Golden Horn, Tarabia, Bukdere on the European shore of the Bosphorus, and occasionally other areas. So the Levant for me is more a conceptual and cultural concept rather than a precise geography. I am illustrating cases, examples of this cultural uh, um, and uh, conceptual uh, idea. But of course, many places, uh, many more places would exemplify the same cultural dynamics. Um, Yeah, so I think I got the right uh, button now. So the, uh, the area I'm mostly interested in is uh, um, the one that was also the stage of diplomacy. And so this is a late, 19, uh, late 18th century map of uh, Istanbul. So Pera, um, the old Genoese uh, medieval settlement. Um, and uh, Tarabia and Buyukdere on the European shore of the Bosphorus, uh, uh, we see some images belonging to different periods. Who lived uh, in these places? Uh, I'm especially concerned with this uh, social dimension because I think it's crucial in order to understand also the iconography. I'm, uh, I was studying uh, and, and the architecture, and I'm mostly focusing on landscape architecture, but for doing this, of course, I need uh, visual and iconographical materials. So this is based uh, on an old studies of the uh, 
plural of the, the non-Muslims of the Ottoman Empire, so the functioning of a plural society, Christians and Jews in the, in the Ottoman Empire. A chapter of this book argues that all the uh, Ottoman social landscape could be described as a spectrum of affiliations. So not just uh, clearly separated, neatly separated social groups, but a much more nuanced and interactive spectrum. You go here, and it could be, this is also a simplification, of course, it could be much more complex, but you go from the most local rooted indigenous Muslim peasant or tribal Turk uh, with uh, degrees of exposure to other cultures and finally the European visitors in the Ottoman Empire who may be, of course, the most foreign, the, the less uh, rooted uh, figure. But, uh, and uh, I divided, this is uh, in partly re-elaborated, but I divided in three groups. It's basically the Muslim, the Ottoman non-Muslims and the Levantines, and the Europeans, so th these three big groups, but with all gradations of uh, um, relative uh, exposure and integration in the, in the local context. Uh, the Ottoman non-Muslim without foreign protection or with foreign protection, foreign passport of, of protection, are different from the Levantines who were usually of European origin and who may have interacted significantly with the, these uh, do we have, uh, yeah, we, with the other mm, non-Muslim Ottomans, so creating um, really a, an environment of intermediation. This is what I'm really um, concerned with. So, um, to go on, diplomacy uh, was a crucial dimension, uh, had a crucial role in this uh, um, social and physical environment of Levantine cohabitation. Diplomatic institutions were not there simply to represent a foreign power at the port, but by virtue of the capitulation, so-called capitulation or uh, ahidname in, uh, in Turkish, they tended to act as courts of a supranational or extraterritorial system that includes schools, churches, hospitals, a courthouse, a prison, a postal service, all gravitating around an embassy. So quite beyond foreign relations, foreign affairs, as the title of this uh, uh, conference reads, we are dealing with uh, jurisdictional dimension, a jurisdictional cluster. Uh, of institutions that challenged Ottoman sovereignty but were also counterbalanced by Ottoman economic and political strategies. It's not a colonial situation. It's far more complex than the colonial uh, <clears throat> binary um, relation between colonizer and, and colonized. Uh, so this has an, it has an effect on landscape. This source of, of legal uh, pluralism and legal peculiarity of the late uh, Ottoman uh, society, if we think that the standard Ottoman landscape created um, with the juxtaposition of residential and monumental structures that we see here, uh, a, a famous view of Istanbul just before the dramatic, before modernization, before the dramatic changes, monuments and uh, monuments in durable materials and also of a different color and houses of timber, wooden. So th this was the hierarchy in, in the landscape of Ottoman Istanbul. All this is countered by, a, pardon, by the emergence of increasingly monumental embassy buildings uh, on the other side of the, of the Golden Horn, so on this side of the city. And all this is linked to the legal, uh, the institutional peculiarities that I, I have mentioned. A, a contemporary observer, very perceptive writer, Ubisi, Abdolonim Ubisini, wrote that the capitulations were an exo a sort of anomaly that creates an, anom an anomalous landscape. Uh, a, 
an exorbitant privilege uh, from which derives this uh, state within the state, imperium in imperio, so that today, by virtue of the capitulation, Pera is no longer Turkey, it is France, England, Austria, Russia, Holland, Spain, with the palaces of their embassies as, as capitals. And we see it clearly here. This is the French, the Russian, the Austrian. Uh, elsewhere, even more um, peculiar results could materialize from this legal system, because in Alexandria, for instance, we have an entire square shaped by diplomacy and by the uh, regime of the of the capitulation of this famous Place de Consul, uh, named in, with very different um, um, labels. Uh, um, I think today it's Mancheya, it was Place Muhammad Ali, but originally known as Place de Consul, where all the consulates were. So, uh, in uh, uh, this is uh, the typical landscape of diplomacy that developed in the second half of the 19th century at Pera and uh, surroundings. It all started with the Russian embassy, I must say. After the fire, the, the fire of 1831, Russia is the first power that rebuilds the embassy in an unprecedented uh, monumental stance. And all the other powers will follow, will somehow have to deal with uh, this uh, uh, Russian presence and compare um, to to it. So um, this is the landscape of domination and encroachment. But before the 1831 fire, and so we come more but closer to the chronology, to the period I will um, focus more in this presentation. Before the 1831 fire, many embassies still retained an Ottoman character and a timber wooden structure even those which presented clearly a European classicizing image like this, like the Venetian, they were often built in wood by local um, craft, local masons, kalfas, not necessarily by a European architect. Uh, several cases, uh, so here the most westernized, but next to them, Holland still retaining an Ottoman character, and Sweden, we have seen also, the, I would uh, um, argue that this is closer to the local context than this, for instance. So we, uh, we have seen already in the previous presentation some of uh, for the Dutch palace for instance we have extensive documentation um, for the others also it's uh, and so th these documents are part of the, the uh, research project that I'm uh, involved uh, for several years uh, here for instance we can see how this uh, process of uh, uh, change uh, uh, materialized. The Venetian and the French, but very close to each other, they present an image of change of uh, relative uh, estrangement uh, from the context. So here in the 18th century, there are still uh, Ottoman structures, uh, while uh, they become uh, quite different in, in uh, and, and more European monumental. Uh, the place where these embassies are um, situated is usually uh, understood today as the most westernized in European part of Istanbul, but it was not so in the, in the past. So when these things were um, constructed, especially this, and they did form, um, or even more this, they formed the contrast with the surroundings. The surroundings were more or less like this. So uh, not really a, a typical um, European, look at the, the wooden houses uh, in Galat, in Pera even more, we have other images. Uh, well, Pera, 
developed from uh, the um, expansion of Galata. With the, Galata is the Genoese colony we see here in a famous uh, uh, Italian miniature before the Ottoman period. This is uh, the 16th century, the 1530s Ottoman miniature showing Galata. And this is a, a 17th century engraving showing the beginning of Pera, the settlement outside the walls of Galata. Um, this settlement was typical, I would say it was typically Ottoman in the, with some anomalies, with some exceptions, but it was a typically Ottoman settlement of wooden houses until the mid um, 19th century, with uh, significant exceptions, of course. These are other images, uh, Pierre Prevost. Uh, and the, here we come to the central image of my uh, presentation. This was, yes, this was a kind of anomaly in, uh, in an Ottoman settlement. This is the Grand Rue de... There was a main street, a uh, um, high street. Uh, we, we, uh, there is a British um, writer comparing precisely this to high street in Edinburgh. And I don't know how legitimately other writers compare this to the Boulevard des Italiens in Paris and even to Broadway in New York, but in different periods, of course. Here I see nothing of Broadway, frankly. I, <laughs> but uh, um, it is a very important visual uh, source here at, in the Victorian Albert Museum probably painted by a local Ottoman Greek or Armenian, question mark, non-identified artist who had been exposed for sure to uh, the influence and the teaching probably of uh, European painters residing uh, in the embassies. So this shows us the anomaly, a European high street, main street, uh, there was nothing comparable on the other side of the Golden Horn in the Ottoman settlement. But what? Um, Ottoman houses surround, the, most of these buildings are of the Ottoman type, timber building with projections, these uh, local bay windows, uh, uh, corbels, wooden corbels. So it, it's, it's really an interesting composition. It's a European avenue made largely of Ottoman houses. In, we are lucky enough to have, uh, I mean, I could identify um, several of these buildings, and for instance, I know exactly which point of the Grand Rue, of, which is today Istiklal, Jadesi, we are uh, watching here around 1809, even the chronology is not entirely certain. Um, so uh, this, for instance, is uh, the Franciscan Church of Saint Antoine, the old Saint Antoine no longer existing. And this is the entrance to the French embassy, which was used at the time by the British ambassador. Why? Because the Ottomans had broken diplomatic relations with the French due to the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt, and because the British embassy was in bad shape at that period, the Sultan Selim III decided that the British ambassador could use the French palace. This is why today in the Victoria and Albert Museum website, this uh, is still identified as uh, the entrance to the British embassy. It's actually to the French palace, but used as a British embassy in this period. Um, we are, as I said, lucky enough to have a, a document showing us the interior of the church uh, from the archives of uh, uh, Propaganda Fide in Rome. This shows that it's not a church um, used only by, say, Italian and French Catholics. It is a very local institution, and all these letter show the different groups that use the church. Uh, the main, the central nave and the lodge opposite, so this guy, are used by Armenian men and women converted to Catholicism. This is a major... Uh, um, cultural, religious development in, in uh, 18th century Istanbul. 
a, a large group of Armenians uh, convert to Catholicism, and so their uh, position as intermediaries becomes even more prominent and relevant. From this document, you can understand that uh, those who used this church belonged to all, almost all the, the uh, um, positions in this spectrum. So it was used by European residents, visitors, Levantines, uh, uh, with or without foreign presence, and not by Armenian apostolic, but, but I, by Armenian Catholics. Uh, it was visited by Muslims, we know also this. So it is a typical example of these um, spaces where a plural society, that, that were used by a plural society. There were also limits to this harmonious coexistence. We know, for instance, that the interior was shaped in order to avoid contacts between the Armenians and the French or Italians. So there was cohabitation, but also limits to the intercourse. Um, it's all, uh, of course, uh, um, it varies from period to period and in different uh, historical contexts. So coming to other parts of this uh, um, picture, what, what is happening here? Uh, what do we see here? This is the core of the most European um, district of Istanbul, but only one figure is dressed as a European. All the others are not. Uh, and this is interesting because, uh, so this might be uh, Stratford Canning, uh, the British diplomat. He was not an ambassador. He was uh, secretary general to the embassy of Robert Adair. He might be the one who either commissioned this series of uh, watercolors. There are more than 100 in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Or he may have simply acquired a, an already made series of uh, of watercolor. This is what this is what we were discussing yesterday with uh, Brian Lewis. <laughs> but um, the interesting fact is that uh, there is a local point of view here. It's not a foreign um, perception of uh, Pera and. Colors are very significant in my view. A costume is also significant. These two personages here may be identified as Armenians, I would guess, from the um, garb and from the headgear. Uh, this is the retinue of the ambassador, the, the janissaries that accompanied the, the ambassador is probably already and has probably entered. Uh, this uh, could be an interpreter, um, a, a dragoman, and um, the human landscape you have here is uh, responding in many ways to the description of a French uh, writer who said, uh, wait, Albert Breyer, uh, who lived around 1810, 1815 in this, he says, um, the Grand Rue de Pera connecting the main embassies and churches uh, used both by European and Ottoman was no longer the privileged site of French and European settlement, the street front. So he regrets that those who inhabited the prestigious mansion built on the street front in the central part of the Grand Rue were no longer French, Italian, German, of British subject, they had been supplanted by local rich families of Armenian and Greek back background. Raya, who Raya is the term which the, um, these non-Muslim um, uh, uh, Ottomans were uh, called. Um, so they had pushed in the background with their socioeconomic power the real Europeans who now mostly inhabited the narrow alleys of the Grand Rue or its marginal section. So, and we see this here. Uh, um, in particular, I was able to track uh, the ownership of this house here. So it corresponds to the story told by Breyer because um, a Russian map that I could read with the help of a Russian friend, uh, dating 1780, 
uh, shows that this house belonged to the Fornetti family. The Fornetti was a dynasty of dragomen working for the French embassy. And it's only natural that they would uh, live uh, just adjacent to the embassy, to the French embassy. Uh, in uh, a later source, uh, early 19th century, the same building is noted on a map as uh, being inhabited by the Tingirian Armenian family uh, of Catholic confession. So, the, and they are here, we see them here, I guess. So this might be a, a female member here. And, this might be the Tingirian family, members of the Tingirian family. Now, this collection of watercolor includes also interesting uh, costume, interesting uh, um, uh, ethno-religious types. Uh, uh, these are Armenians in the same series of drawings. Uh, uh, this might be an Armenian of some um, an important of some rank, uh, while this of a more common uh, social background. Uh, then we see um, drogmans, uh, uh, interpreters. Um, the drogmans uh, working for the embassies were usually from Levantine families of European background, while the interpreters drogmans of the Sultan were from Greek and uh, Armenian uh, Ottoman uh, families, usually. This is uh, uh, another interesting source. This is Izmir now, in, for a moment. We should, another interesting source shows uh, uh, another um, diploma, official reception of a lieutenant uh, who visited a French lieutenant who visited Izmir in the 1766? Uh, here, all the groups are labeled, uh, numbered, and uh, described in a legend. And we see, for instance, uh, the Janissaries uh, here and the eight interpreters, four. Uh, of the uh, Ottoman and four of the European uh, diplomatic provenance. But they dress more or less in the same uh, fashion, both the Europeans and uh, so. I, uh, Finally, the way architecture is represented, the way Ottoman architecture, Ottoman and Byzantine uh, architecture is represented in this collection of watercolors is also interesting because I see uh, a sort of domestication here. Ottoman monuments made to appear less, less exotic than they would be in uh, a totally European uh, perspective or in a detached, uh, distant, orientalist perspective. So I see, for instance, the arches of uh, uh, Sultan Ahmed uh, drawn not as pointed as they are in reality. And later, around 1820, these drawings form the basis for another series of drawings, uh, again, in the um, Victoria and Albert, in the Seerite collection, Victoria and Albert. Here, uh, the, the pitch of these Ottoman arches has completely disappeared. It's the same monument, but it, it's represented more like a Baroque interior, a, a European Baroque interior. And, and what uh, the artist chose to, to represent is also interesting. This is uh, the mausoleum of the uh, mother of Mahmoud II. It's a, a totally Europeanized building in reality, not only in the representation. And it's chosen as uh, part, uh, as, as a representative aspect of Ottoman architectural culture. Even more, so, so this is the just to show you the, the real arch in Sultan Ahmed and how it is uh, transferred, uh, translated in a more familiar language. Uh, this has roots, I would say, that other, other uh, European, or not only uh, Greek uh, or Armenian Ottoman, but other, Van Moor also, it's interesting how um, he totally transforms uh, the Ottoman architectural forms into something more from the, drawing Sultan Ahmed with these arches, I mean, it's not 
quite visible. Or drawing the palace of Ibrahim Pasha, it, this looks like an Italian building. And also these arches, these arcades become uh, some early, early Venetian Renaissance if you, if you uh, this transform them. Like, and so I think the, the Victorian Albert drawings are also part of a tradition of uh, domestication of Ottoman architecture, which is uh, a mm, part of the um, Orientalist or part of the European approach to uh, the Middle East. Uh, a most significant um, document is this uh, selection of Ottoman architectural forms, uh, which shows uh, uh, several kinds of, uh, of columns, capitals. Only one is typically Ottoman for us today. The others are part of the uh, so-called uh, westernization, hybridization, however we want to call it, Ottoman Baroque, Ottoman Rococo styles that were common in the period this um, um, document was produced. Now we, I think we have little uh, time, but just briefly, so there is a there was a coexistence of uh, um, local and imported forms, which was noted by several writers. This is another artist, Castellan, uh, stayed in uh, in Istanbul in 1797. He writes uh, colonnades and and pediments of marble contrasting with uh, the uh, pointed arcades of Ottoman, the domes of Ottoman. And he gives this example, so a mosque and a neoclassical, the Venetian embassy I showed before. Uh, or here again, the uh, French neoclassical palace and the, the uh, Dutch uh, still Ottomanizing embassy. Uh, this was uh, also evident in the Bosphorus shore. Some of the most famous images of the Bosphorus uh, produced by Antoine Ignace uh, Melling, um, the French Alsatian um, artist, he, he represented this coexistence of uh, a more westernized and uh, a local traditional um, architectural style. But all this was happening when, when the Bosphorus became a politically a crucial area, not before. We don't have an iconography of the Bosphorus of this kind, of this level, before the second half of the 18th century, because it is in the second half of the 18th century that the straits become crucial with the Russian thread. And here, these uh, um, uh, opening, the, the embouchure of the, the Black Sea, from the Bosphorus becomes so present, so uh, visible in, uh, uh, in the iconography of this region. Uh, this is Carboniano, an Armenian Catholic uh, diplomat who was also able to draw, and he published some uh, engravings, uh, uh, Melling himself. Uh, so the, the, the straight, really, the, the opening to the, the Black Sea becomes crucial, and this is the same anonymous grip in the in the in the VNA. So uh, this uh, mm, the Bosphorus gains visual prominence uh, in uh, relation with major geopolitical changes. All the summer embassies we have seen already some of this in the previous presentation. The summer embassies move from the forest of Belgrade to the shores of the Bosphorus precisely in connection with this uh, uh, political relevance that the straits are acquiring. And we see here an interesting uh, uh, defavre from a private collection uh, showing the French ambassador uh, uh, moving out of his uh, residence uh, with a cake. So uh, here, um, all uh, aspects of this iconography are significant. The cost, uh, here there is, for instance, it's not clearly visible, but a European and an Ottoman conversing uh, with each other. Um, the representation of the shores as a sort of urban environment uh, and the backstage as, as countryside is, is very prominent uh, here. 
Um, Uh, yes, from a closer point of view, we can see that uh, De Favre was used later by Luigi Meyer, who translated this. I, I suspect that uh, the cake, the French cake that we see here, becomes a British cake in the, the, mm, the cake of the British ambassador, but using the same site. In fact, also the British embassy was in, uh, in Tarabia. Uh, and see how uh, interesting is the social uh, landscape uh, here. Uh, these are the two personages, uh, European and Ottoman. This is probably a Boston a guard, uh, an Ottoman uh, guard. The uh, ships are also Im important. Here we have uh, a, um, a Russian um, commercial ship in uh, uh, in Buyukdere, here we have the former British summer embassy that became Russian eventually. Um, all these places are very carefully depicted uh, because of the new uh, relevance. Uh, when I mm, uh, when I show these cakes, it's also important the number of rowers. You know, there were sumptuary laws uh, regulating the color of dress, the color of even houses, facades of houses. The number of rowers is very important. A, an ambassador can have, the most important ambassador can have at most six rowers, not more. And the Russians were recently given permission to have six uh, rowers. So all these numbers are... Finally, the last aspect I'm going to consider in this uh, broad overview is cultural cross-dressing. Uh, which I see also as related to the coexistence of uh, European and Ottoman styles in architecture and to the possibility of shifting constantly from one position to another. These are the, the ambassador Vergen and his wife, uh, who was uh, a Levantine woman from the Vivier family, a local um, woman. Um, the, De Favre is one of the few, there are not so many ambassadors, there, there are a few, but not as many. The merchants, for instance, were very often, and the deep other, the drugmans were very often portrayed in uh, Ottoman Turkish garb. But here I would say this is not simply a Turkery, it's not indulging in an exoticist pose, because we, we know from many other um, context that it was not simply exotic. I mean, th this uh, way of, the, it was not perceived simply as exotic. One important clue comes from another diplomat, uh, the, the ambassador, Saint-Priest, the um, French ambassador who followed Vergin. When he arrived at Pera, at the French embassy, the first thing he noticed was that Vergin's son, one of the children of, the, of this couple, was dressed normally as a Turk, because uh, probably his mother, being from a Levantine family with roots, considered normal to dress her son as, uh, uh, as a Turk, not as a European. So uh, the father of such cannot consider exotic, so to be simply as exotic, this way of dressing. Um, uh, Again, in, the, in this line, there is an iconography. De Favre is the painter who is very interesting in the, I showed before his image of Tarabia. Antoine de Favre is uh, um, very attracted, I would say, by this ambivalence. And here, this um, image in the Pera Museum in Istanbul of um, uh, a European dressed in Turkish garb. Uh, was recently in a conference in Marseille, the Musée de, de, de la Méditerranée, and uh, was read by an Italian um, scholar, Alessandra Masci, as uh, a reference to uh, the ambivalent choices that one is uh, uh, facing in the Levant. This ambivalence is uh, underlined by the shape of the tree that I'm not uh, an expert in this kind of iconography, but this scholar argued that uh, the bifurcating tree 
is traditionally an emblem of uh, ambivalence or um, uh, the indecision between virtue and vice, between uh, pleasure and uh, morality. So this figure, a European dressed, you know, placed in the uh, background of this tree, acquires a special meaning. Uh, I don't think it is uh, a denigration of this ambivalence because De Favre himself portrayed, uh, produced a self-portrait uh, here in the, this is in the Uffizi, uh, self-portrait as an Asiatic philosopher with uh, the crown of Malta. He was, uh, um, he had lived in Malta before coming to Istanbul, and Hagia Sophia in the background uh, giving really the coordinates of his personality. The fact that he, he called himself this self-portrait um, as an Asiatic philosopher, I think it tells us much about uh, the uh, possibilities of looking things from different uh, perspectives that uh, the Levant offers. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, cultural cross-dressing and architectural ambivalence should be read also as a product of the plural society that surrounds such visual experiences. In previous periods, the European perception of this hybridity was more that of a Babel-like confusion, as Lucette Valencia argued in a study entitled La Tour de Babel. In the late 18th, the, in this period I'm, I'm interested here, notwithstanding the undeniable pressure eastward of European imperialism, but the Ottoman environments I briefly surveyed were part also of a European reflection on and experience of cosmopolitanism, as shown by Koller in a recent study, East of Enlightenment, where he shows that Figure de Montbrun, a, a French traveler, was influential for the thinking of Voltaire and Rousseau about cosmopolitan, and Rousseau himself practiced cultural cross-dressing. He wore an Armenian kaftan in Paris for several years. His father was a Levantine we, uh, from Galata. We, so this exposure is not an exoticizing taste. It's not there just for. Uh, later in the 19th century, national cultural cause and a more unbalanced set of power relations with European powers holding the upper hand as well as the development of global capitalism produced a new iconography of the Levant, uh, which is not so subtly ambivalent, I would say, as the things I've... So from here to, to here, this is uh, the image of dominance uh, that I showed before. And from uh, here to here, this is this, almost the same section of the Grand Rue de Perrin, uh, there are um, department stores, there are all national flags yes, celebrating the Ottoman constitution, but everything is a, in a totally different framework than uh, what we see here. Uh, again, um, the shows of the Bosphorus, more urban um, and more militarized also by uh, 1877. This is the Ottoman ironclads uh, going to fight against uh, Russia. And uh, architectural culture, this is 189 and this is 1873. By 1873, the Ottoman official um, culture had produced a, a, a codified vision of Ottoman architecture in which all these uh, hybrid examples would have no place and Ottoman architectural culture and style were codified very um, scientifically, we would say, it in uh, quotes. This is part of a treaty of Ottoman architecture presented in 1873 at the Universal Exhibition in London. So, um, but we should not read, my conclusion is, uh, we should not read this iconography of a plural and ambivalent environment with the teleological awareness of what is going to become later. So in this way, we may be able to find more nuances and less binary oppositions, less 
overarching categories also in the following development of European-Ottoman interaction. Jacqueline Kahanov defined the Levant as a prism, as an intersection and overlap of vision and experiences enriched by cultural difference, rather than as a static mosaic. The mosaic is a very current metaphor to describe this pluralism, but it's not very useful, not very functional. Because of its diversity, she wrote, the Levant has been compared to a mosaic, bits of stone of different colors assembled into a flat picture. To me, it is more like a prism whose various facets are joined by the sharp edge of differences, but each of which, according to its position in time-space continuum, reflects or refracts light. This is a later definition of the Levant, but it shows that what I showed for the 18th for the circa 1800, for the late 18th and early 19th century, does not entirely disappear. Uh, several regions and urban environments of the Ottoman Empire may, exemplified, may, may have exemplified this understanding of the Levant around 1800. This inevitably sketchy overview has shown how the main concern in the iconographic formation representing these sites was not exoticism and alterity, but rather a hybrid plural, human and architectural, natural and landscape of encounters, the Levantine prism that um, Kahan speaks of, in which self and other often overlap. Thank you, and excuse me for exceeding a little bit the, the limits. Of <laughs> Thank you, Professor Paolo, for your interesting. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about the, um, the view of the Grand Rue de Pera that we were looking yes. at yesterday. Uh, that the, whether the Armenian inhabitants remained there in, uh, in the early, in, on into the 19th century, oh. or whether it became more uh, uh, diverse. It be, yes. Um, yeah, this is an important point. As I said, many things changed in the course of the 19th century, and also the, the social topography of Pera changed. So um, many Armenian and especially Armenian Catholic uh, uh, properties remained on the street front, but uh, they were flanked by more and more um, renewed European presence, not the Levantine, maybe, not only the Levantine uh, Europeans, but uh, new immigrants, especially with the Crimean War and with the opening of uh, the Ottoman Empire to international trade. We have more and more interest, uh, commercial interest uh, of Europeans who settle um, along the Grand Rue. So the, the final uh, image that I showed, 1908, reflects that. So you have uh, Bon Marché, for instance. You have uh, uh, photographers uh, of European and also local background living on the, uh, working on the Grand Rue. Um, there is an American flag. It's the Singer Manufacturing Company. So, Yes, it changes, uh, the, the, but there is still the, this uh, imprint of the Armenian Catholics. I think it's uh, so important and so neglected in the historiography of uh, Bayon, of, of, of uh, this Thank part of much. Istanbul. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
coexistence and tension as, as always. Uh, in the beginning, uh, yes, the Armenian Catholics were seen as other, were not uh, always accepted as part of the Catholic flock. Um, the document I showed was sent to Rome especially uh, because uh, uh, the local priests uh, realized that it was appropriate uh, to separate these groups. They were separate not only according to ethnicity, but also gender and social rank. So we have a very complex layout in which uh, the diplomats on the upper floor, the common people on the lower floor, but near the, near the altar. The, uh, the, the, the largest community is, I mean, this was the surprise that I, I found, the, uh, the largest uh, group were, were the Armenian men and women, separate, uh, ground floor, the Armenian men, and on the gallery, the Armenian women. So the source I read and was sent to Rome says it's uh, necessary to um, uh, adopt this division because we cannot, uh, we don't want uh, uh, Levantine ladies and or French ladies to be so close in contact with Armenian men. They had to be all on the ground floor. Uh, so, it, and, and this created other liturgical problems because with this division, the women uh, were too close to the altar, and that was a problem from the Roman point of view. So it, it's, uh, it's a compromise, but yeah, it shows the limits, uh, yes, of this uh, harmonious cohabitation, but in other, in other ways, the fact that a single space was used constantly and systematically by so many groups, to me, is very significant of, uh, so, but yes, and, and of course in time, many, many Armenian Catholic families will intermarry with Europeans and Levantines, and so this cultural um, um, gap will be bridged in many, in many ways. Thank you. Ah, the land, yeah, the other part. Uh, many, um, many Armenian Catholics, were, well, became, uh, became Catholic because of uh, schooling, because the Jesuit, the French Jesuit especially, were very effective. In, so they spoke either French or Italian, usually. In the, in the liturgy, um, I think this was an important controversy whether to, to I think Armenian was used in the um, official Armenian Catholic liturgy only after 1830, after 18, because in 1830 only the Armenians are uh, recognized, the Armenian Catholics are recognized as a new millet, millet is the, the Ottoman uh, term, uh, and so they can have churches of their own. They no longer share, this is another development, they no longer share the churches with, uh, with the Italians and French. And so they have more concessions in the way of like using Armenian also in the liturgy, at least some part. Uh, of the liturgy, but culturally, they they use the uh, French and they use, for instance, the Latin alphabet also in inscriptions. In so, they, they, they were, of course, they they belong to both cultures. And uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, Professor Paulo, for your presentation.